92, I am told, with a faculty of four, including the president and a student body of 57, all of whom were college preparatory. And in the years which have elapsed since that beginning, a great many impressive developments have taken place on the campus of the University of Oklahoma, and a great many impressive events have transpired here. But I think I'm safe in saying that in all of those years, no more <coughs> impressive event has been staged than the one in which we are participating this evening. Never on any occasion have we had as impressive a group of statesmen and public personalities on our campus, and I suspect that it will be a long time before we have this experience again. And because I'm welcome <laughs> on the campus. <laughs> <laughs> and so in lieu of a welcome, I want to simply bring you greetings. You are, of course, indeed welcome, but I want to bring you greetings from the university family, from the student body, from the faculty, from the regents of the university, from the university alumni, all of those interested in this great institution. And I do bring these greetings to you officially, of course, on behalf of the institution and all that it represents. But I bring them to you also in a warm personal sense. I am truly glad that you're here. I am glad to be with you. And I hope that you enjoy this evening as much as I intend to do. Thank you. Roosevelt, President Truman, my fellow Sooners. Don, I'm glad you spent so much time around my office. I'm sure it was my office force that put me in that break. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Roosevelt and President Truman, we're honored here in Oklahoma to have this opportunity to pause as current events become history and we reflect back 25 years ago today the seven league boots with which your great husband led this nation from its knees in depression to the greatest power in the world and to lead on with the idealism to establish a just and lasting peace. We're proud to have our, our great president, our greatest living president, and one of the truly great big six of all history here to make the address on this occasion. And in the footsteps of Franklin Delano Roosevelt followed a spunky, fighting crusader of the real meaning of crusader, Harry S. Truman, to follow on and to build a firm foundation under the blueprints of peace that has been left to him by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It's too bad. foreign policy. We appreciate that they have carried on the programs and plans of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Harry S. Truman. But in this flattery of imitation, we only wish they would have followed that which FDR and Harry Truman would have followed, and that is to have a new model every year. I don't think Bud Wilkinson could win consistently in the Big Seven and in the United States, the football championships we've won here in Oklahoma, if he still played the same plays every year for seven years in the same conference. And I'm afraid that Mr. Dulles does not know that the Russians are on the old Statue of Liberty play and know how to block it. <laughs> which I fear are lacking today in our foreign policy. And it is in our foreign policy and the success of that policy in which the ideals of world peace of both of the two great democratic presidents uh, will be based for future generations. It's a thrill to have you here with us as we celebrate 
this great and auspicious occasion of the 25th anniversary of the man who said we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Thank you. We find a man who in 1944 had the privilege and brought the honor to the state of Oklahoma of delivering the keynote address in which Franklin Delano Roosevelt was nominated for the last time to the Democratic National Convention. We find that he was elected in 1848 to the United States Senate. And you will find that of all the senators who walk upon the floor, you will find no man that the GOP fears more. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> With a great deal of personal pleasure that I present to you the senior senator from the state of Oklahoma, the Honorable Robert S. Kerr. Thank you, Don, Mrs. Roosevelt, President Truman, my cherished friends of Oklahoma democracy. It is a cherished privilege to appear before you in your own right and then to make articulate to the degree that I may your greetings to these great people who come here to our state. Certainly, the greatest living symbol of the glory and queenhood of American women and to one of the noblest of all the modern Romans who has ever lifted the democratic banner in the field of combat for human rights, our beloved neighbor from independence. We're happy to have our great national chairman this is the second time in a few months that he's been on the campus of this university. Paul, I want to tell you right now, you stay around here. Before long, they'll be calling you doctor and asking you for an autograph because you... <laughs> we'll jog along on this Missouri mule and Democratic donkey until such time as the bird stirs her nest and takes off into the ocean. <laughs> I want to refer to, you said that the New Deal has not stopped. I want to share the optimism of that statement and reinforce it, if I might, by the declaration that after 20 years of the New Deal under Roosevelt and Truman, it will never stop. But I want to say to you that nothing ever had a more severe test than it has had for the last five years. I think it's quite noteworthy that our president has finally disclosed the details of his theretofore secret agreement with Mr. Nixon, <laughs> whereby the vice president would take over if it becomes official that Ike has become disabled. President Truman told the press upon his arrival here today that that agreement can have no validity or legality in the absence of congressional approval. I say to you, Mr. President, that was a redundant and 
unnecessary statement? Be worth a nickel if Congress approved it twice, unless Sherman Adams accepted it. <laughs> In our history, I know that 170 million Americans are unconquerable, indomitable, and invincible. But oh, I think you agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that the pride of Oklahoma is in its United States Senators. The next guest that you will hear from comes to us from Columbus, Ohio. This man heads the young Democrats throughout our entire nation. He serves as national president of the young Democrats having been elected in Reno, Nevada in November 1957 to this great state. It is with pleasure that I present to you the National Young Democrats President, Nelson Lancion. Thank you very much, Don Middleton. First Lady of the World, Mrs. Roosevelt, First Citizen of America, Harry S. Truman, Governor Gary, Senators, distinguished guests, and young Democrats all. I to refer to a very happy day for me last uh, October. When I came as an alumnus of the University of Notre Dame to participate in the great rivalry that exists between our two great universities. And I want to say here publicly on the campus of this university, as a representative and alumnus of the University of Notre Dame, and as a longtime football fan that's traveled with the Notre Dame team from coast to coast and been in practically every city where Notre Dame has ever played uh, another team, that my hat is off to the alumni and the student body of Oklahoma as the greatest group of sportsmen in America today, the way you accepted it. Dr. Cross and to the number one football coach of the country, Bud Wilkinson, for their magnificent <laughs> That digression because we're not here to sing the praises of either Notre Dame or your great University of Oklahoma. But we are privileged to be here under the auspices of the Young Democrats of Oklahoma University to pay our reverent tribute to the greatest president of the United States that ever served our country and the world, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You honor her tonight because she was the eyes and ears of our president when he served our country. And as she traveled around the country and talked to its citizens and found out what their problems were, what their needs were, and she was attuned to their needs and to their problems too. She was talking to the people on the streets of our cities and towns, trying to find out how the government of the United States, the most powerful government in all the world, could be more responsive to the needs of the people. And all for such understanding today in the White House, uh, if only our president had an understanding of what the people are crying out for today in the way of leadership, not only in our domestic po problems, but in our international problems as well. So all of us, I know, are proud indeed and happy to be a humble part of this tribute to you, Mrs. Roosevelt, as the one who had the greatest impact and made the greatest contribution to that deep, warm, and human understanding of the problems of our government in relationship to the people of our country. And also <laughs> be able to pay tribute to the man who carried on with such vigor and such fidelity and devotion and with such courage, with such a fighting heart at every time and in the face of every obstacle and every great burden and responsibility of the office of presidency, 
uh, Mr. Harry S. Truman, uh, the number one citizen of our country today. The Democratic governor of the state of Oklahoma, the Honorable Raymond Gary. The next speaker. But before I present the next speaker, I want to express my appreciation to the young Democrats of the University of Oklahoma for having thought of this idea and having made this program such a great success. A few days ago, I told uh, Roosevelt as I've had this depression that it ever had to one of the highest standards of living enjoyed by the people of any nation on the face of the earth. The president that enabled the farmers of this nation that had been foreclosed, lost their homes, to repossess that land that they loved and to get a new hold on life the great man that he was. I'm happy that Mrs. Roosevelt can be here tonight on this great occasion. She's honored us twice during the last year and a half by visiting Oklahoma. And this nation is fortunate in having her services during this trying time. We're happy, Mrs. Roosevelt, that you can be here. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the leader that led this nation from the depths of the great, presenting this great American on another occasion, about this time a year ago, up at Oklahoma State University. Along beside men like Franklin D. Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Thomas Jefferson, and another, a few more of the great presidents of this land as one of the most courageous, one of the men who was called upon to make decisions, use the atomic bomb for the first time history of the world. The man who led this nation during one of the most serious periods in the history of the nation. It gives me great pleasure to present to you this great American leader and great world citizen and a president a man that we love very much, and we still refer to him, and will always refer to him as long as he lives, as Mr. President. Thank you very much. I more than appreciate that. but I never did. <laughs> I never did give these Republicans hell. I just told the truth on them. And they think it's right. <laughs> Chairman, Don Middleton. You know, my grandfather's, grandfather Truman's oldest sister married a Middleton, and if I were running for office, I could claim kin with him and probably get his vote. <laughs> Mr. Chairman of the Democratic Party, the governor of the great state of Oklahoma. They and Oklahoma have redeemed themselves. They have each have two outstanding, able senators. When I was in the United States Senate, I was there for about 10 years. And while I was president of the United States, the great state of Indiana and the great state of Missouri used to have trouble as to who had the two worst senators. We've gotten rid of ours now. <laughs> <laughs> Indiana did the same thing. Missouri today. 
You see, I've been placed in a position at, at to remember the greatest of the great presidents and to introduce the great first lady of the world. And I've been instructed in between times that I must deliver a lecture to the students of Oklahoma University on the presidency and what it means. Now, you've had the most wonderful speeches that you could possibly have. I've got a situation here where you're going to have to wait to hear the first lady of the world, so you'll have to listen to me whether you like it or not. <laughs> to this end, I've built a presidential library in Independence in which I've placed all my papers for research and study by all qualified students. There are four million of those documents, and if you think it'd be nice to go through them, it'll take you about eight years, but it'll do you good. <laughs> <coughs> President Roosevelt and President Hoover and the Hayes Foundation in Ohio have established precedents for the, uh, the maintenance and the care of presidential papers. If we can continue that precedent, and I think there's a uh, chance that the present occupant of the White House is going to establish the same sort of a program at Abilene, Kansas, then we'll have the thing in the groove so we can go ahead with it. Mm -hmm. We've succeeded in getting legislation passed to take care of the presidential papers in the Library of Congress, which hardly have been touched since they've been there. On dedication day, last July, the building and contents of my library were turned over to the federal government for an operation and maintenance by the National Archives. When all my papers have been properly sorted and indexed, I hope that some of you will come to Independence and go to work on them and see what you can find, see whether you can find anything different from what you've seen in the papers. The first three articles of the Constitution outline the three branches of the government of this great republic. Article one sets up the legislative branch of our government, and that branch uh, uh, has certain powers and duties which are assigned to it by the Constitution. Article two says that sometimes that's necessary. Lincoln had quite an experience with two or three generals. I think one of them was named McClellan, and he ran for president after he was fired. <laughs> <laughs> Another one was named Pope. Pope's uh, po story about Pope is one of the most interesting ones. He came from the western side of the Appalachian Mountains, and Lincoln put him in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And he made a statement for the welfare of the country that he was head his headquarters were in the saddle. And after he lost the second battle of Bull Run, old Horace Greeley said his headquarters undoubtedly were in the saddle, and he sat on his brains. <laughs> Political party leadership was the last thing the Constitution contemplated. The founding fathers did not intend the election of the president to be mixed up in the hurly-burly of politics. But our two-party system, as it developed, changed all this. The electric college became a formality, and the president has come to be elected by the whole people, and as a result, the president emerged as the man who led his party to political victory and who was expected to set its policies in the future. Through his policies and his actions, the president must try to convince the people that his party can run the national government better than the opposition, and I think I've proved it. But this time, we must never forget that he is responsible to all the people in the nation, regardless of party. And he must always think of the welfare of the nation as a whole. The president and the vice president are the only officers elected from the United States at large. And as, as I've said time and again, the president is the only lobbyist in Washington who looks after the interests of about 150 million people. The other 15 million are able to hire people to go to Washington and to present their claims to Congress on any subject they choose. That's lobbying. And it's a breathtaking office we are celebrating here tonight. I knew him very, very well. He was exceedingly kind to me, but I want to say to Mrs. Roosevelt that he got me into an awful lot of trouble. <laughs> he was also forced into a war. I noticed the other day in one of the newspapers that uh, a certain city in Japan had passed a resolution saying that I ought to have been ashamed, and I said I dropped the atomic bomb to end the war. And I couldn't answer it, but you know, I was thinking how nice it would have been if somebody would apologize for Pearl Harbor. It's for all you young men and women to become curious about the history of your country and the world. 
and follow through by hard work to keep this republic the greatest in the history of the world. Uh, you'll notice as I went through this thing, I enumerated for you the great presidents, and they were always followed by some fellows who were not quite so good, and that's what I want to bring home to you. <laughs> and if you study your history carefully, you'll find that I'm stating facts to you, and I'm not bragging on myself when I do that. You know that very well, because I think that this man here, Woodrow Wilson, and the other great men I've named as President of the United States were the greatest that ever filled the White House and did the job. And now I have a duty and a pleasure that I certainly enjoy more than anything that's happened since I've been here. It's my privilege and pleasure to introduce the lady who informed me that I was President of the United States. She gave me the greatest shock I ever had in the world, and I'm not easily shocked, as you all know. But it was a terrible thing when I was informed by Mrs. Roosevelt that the President of the United States had died and that the duty and the responsibilities were mine. I offered to do anything I could to help the family and she informed me very politely that I was the one that needed help and that they'd do anything they possibly could to help me and they did. I want to tell you that you've got a privilege tonight to be able to listen to the greatest lady that I know except one and she's an independent and sick with the flu or she'd have been here. And that's Mrs. Franklin D. Roosevelt, whom I present to you as the first lady of the world. We really were in a crisis. It was a domestic crisis. But it had its effect upon the other parts of the world. And other countries were also in crisis. Now, that crisis was a challenge to the American people. And the American people had not actually been given an opportunity to know what was needed to meet that crisis. They had been told that prosperity was just around the corner, that uh, nothing was really wrong. And as a result, it took some very plain speaking to the people of this country together with confidence. Confidence? Bear itself. That came out of confidence in the American people. He knew that if the American people understood what they had to do, what they had to back their leaders in trying to do, somehow they would meet the challenge, and they did. The young Democrats will not remember the atmosphere, but perhaps their parents will have told them that it will be like that too. And I think it inspired a desire for freedom and for ability to take part in your government, to be a part of it, to be an important entity in your government. And I think that period of our history was a very important period to an enormous number of people all over the world. And I think we must remember that because it is good for us to know what are the things that established the admiration and goodwill of people towards the United States in other parts of the world. Now, we had barely pulled out the we faced that crisis, and I think we will always be grateful for the leadership of President Truman, because he brought that war by one of the most difficult decisions that any human being ever had to make to an end, more quickly than it could otherwise have been brought to an end. Discovery. 
the destructive powers that we have discovered. But they are also powers that we may turn to great good. But that will require wisdom and patience and imagination educating all of us as people. And so I would like to tell you what I think is the challenge before us today, because you young Democrats and we who are older are going to meet this challenge in the next few years. I think it absolutely essential that we preserve a balance in military strength in the world. I would not like to see any nation offered the temptation to believe that with one action, one aggressive action, they could wipe out all the opposition and be free of retaliation. democracy and freedom. And we have always thought that, oh, this wasn't really very important. Uh, we would like uh, to get rid of it wherever we found it, but that it was really a world challenge. Mm, no, no, no. We needn't bother too much about that thought. I want you to know that I think from the time of the Geneva Conference, the Soviet leaders, or the Communist Party, let us say, because whoever is leader in the Soviets, the Communist Party will go right on and will be the, the dictator of the policies. The Communist Party, I think, decided that war was probably not going to be the instrument through which they could win their objective which has never changed. Khrushchev said to me only last September, you're wasting your time. You've had feudalism. You've had capitalism. A little bit of socialism. The law of the future is communism. To your opinion, and you will work for it, but I have a right to mine, and I will work for it. And I think we have to do some work because I